you know what? Let's start with something that's not directly the Supreme Court, but rather enabled by the Supreme Court. We can sort of welcome in the wonderful new world that we live in. Why, you might ask, is Vice blocking the top half of my window with a giant black bar? I don't know. We may never find out. The Texas Attorney General says he's willing and able to defend a ban on sodomy. Uh, in 2003, Lawrence v. Texas made it illegal for states to ban gay sexual activity, but the Supreme Court has opened the door to reinstating those bans. So, uh, yeah, this is pretty upfront. Not much analytical work for me to do here, I gotta say. You know, normally I'm, I'm happy to play the role of interpreter, but I think this is actually pretty straightforward. Remember how I said back when the um, Roe v. Wade draft statement leaked? I said they're going to come after a bunch next. They're going to come after contraception. They're going to come after, uh, you know, the anti-sodomy stuff. And, you know, I got a lot of, oh, you're being hyperbolic. Well, not only has Clarence Thomas, in his ruling on the Roe v. Wade overturning, uh, said that he wants to revisit the um, Lawrence v. Texas decision, but you have the Texas AG just flat out saying, yeah, this, this, this guy's like a proud boy, okay? Stand back, stand by. He's ready. And you need to understand how bad this gets, okay? We are not that far off from truly draconic uh, anti-sodomy legislation in the United States, you know? You know, what, what, what was it that happened back in Stonewall? And this wasn't even in Texas, by the way. This was not, this is half a century ago. And back then it was, they would arrest people who cross-dressed, wouldn't they? If you were a guy and you were arrested, and you were found to have had three or more articles of clothing determined to be women's clothing, you were thrown in jail. It was three, wasn't it? Three or more. You had to have a panties and bra on, but if you have stockings too, that's that. Three. That was in the 60s. In New York. Yeah, limited to two. Was this actually enforced? Its enforcement was what kicked off Stonewall. The cops busted on in to a known gay bar, Stonewall, to get a bunch of arrests. Why, though? Because they hate homosexuals and trans people. How do they determine if they were yours, not your girlfriend's? You're wearing them. That's it. Just what you're wearing. I, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I, I can't really overstate this, you know. It, this is just, they just hate you. But here you've got the AG just flat out saying, the year of our Lord, 2022, that he is ready and um, willing. You know, let me take a look on the books. What is the actual on-the-books Texas anti-sodomy law? Um, because it's still there, you know. It's not enforceable because of the Lawrence v. Texas decision, but they never got rid of the law. So. What is the technical language here? Texas anti-sodomy law. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, oh, I refreshed the page and the vice thing went away. I was going to say, does it say here? All kind of issues here. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do
of the same sex. Yeah, trust me, the pronoun used here, using he as the generic default catch-all pronoun, is pretty common in law, uh, especially older laws. So what this means is that uh, the unprecedented power and authority of the modern-day U.S. surveillance state in a post-9-11, post-Patriot Act world will be turned against the homosexual. Uh, that's all of you. Uh, if you live in Texas and the AG decides to enforce this anti-sodomy law, uh, any evidence the government can get their hands on indicating that you might have engaged in it might be prompting an investigation. Folks, all of you can be found out for it. If you think the government doesn't have the ability to prompt an investigation based on the no doubt overwhelming deluge of evidence that you all have left online, that you participate in homosexual activity, um, you're fooling yourself. They will. A Class C misdemeanor for who you sleep with in your bedroom. Wonderful stuff. And of course, this is just the existing anti-sodomy law in the book. There's absolutely no reason to think that Texas wouldn't just go ahead and pass worse, more restrictive anti-sodomy laws. Make it a felony, why not, you know? Have fun with it? I really want to indicate here, like, this is truly beyond the pale stuff. I mean, we are backsliding so rapidly, and we're backsliding here. Why doesn't Biden just executive order these rights? Not his, uh, not his right to. The executive order doesn't cover state legislation, I'm afraid. Um... Now, there are other things that Biden can do, but an executive order isn't a solution to this particular problem. This is serious stuff, folks. I mean, we're talking about the U.S. of A and genuine life ruination stuff over just being gay. Yeah, a classy misdemeanor can lead to an up to six-month jail term or a $2,000 fine. Depending on the circumstances of the case, it can vary significantly, you know? Um, this, I mean, effectively a criminalization of homosexuality. Would anyone contest the belief that this is, without a shadow of a doubt, a genocide? I mean, making it illegal to be of a given group is about as clear-cut as doing a genocide as you can get. I mean, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't begin at the death camps, right? You know, the death camps tend to follow the illegalizing your existence. You know, there's usually kind of a lead up. Our criteria for determining genocide don't begin after it's over with, you know? Uh, ideally, you want to identify a genocide before the victims of the genocide are uh, contained entirely within mass graves and ash pits. You know, you, you want to, you want to be on it a little bit faster than that, uh, if, if at all possible. Um, there is something about this that makes me wonder if the Republicans are overextending their reach a little bit. Um, obviously, a good number of Republicans just flat out want you dead. Uh, you know, they would laugh as you're tortured to death. Uh, you know, it would be delightful entertainment to them. They would revel in it with the voyeuristic glee of a French peasant sprinting to the front of the crowd so they could watch the next beheading. Um, but uh, there are a lot of Republicans who aren't like that, you know. There are Republicans who are just fucking retarded, um, and just somehow, despite what they support and what they say, aren't just explicitly genocidal. I don't, I'm not entirely sure how that works. I don't know why they're like that, uh, you know. I'm not sure how exactly they can parse out that um, raging inconsistency, but there are people like that, and I feel like stuff like this, you know, the, uh, the AG, like, if they actually did go ahead, oh, there goes the black bar again, if they actually did go ahead and do this, I mean, that would probably drum up quite a bit of sympathy for the people they persecute. And prosecute. I don't know why you don't think this won't result in complete civil unrest and rioting. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. When have I ever said we're not going to get complete civil unrest and rioting? I am, in fact, the premier 
a predictor of civil rest and unrioting, you know. I, I divine uh, its likelihood to be quite high. They literally think we're Satan. That is true. Wait, what is this? Satan responds to Roe from the Babylon Bee. I can't watch two minutes of a cringy comedy skit, but it's very easy. Conservative comedy is very little about comedy, so it's about how Satan likes abortions or something. Great. Aren't, um, aren't aborted fetuses supposed to go to heaven or purgatory or whatever? Wouldn't Satan want humans to grow so they can sin and go to hell? Whatever. Um, not like it has to make any sense. It's all made up. Everything is made up. Nothing is real. Uh, great. Yeah. Okay. Um, <sighs> just thought it would be nice to review the history of sodomy laws in the United States, you know? Um, I thought it might be a little fun. Uh, let's, let's do that, huh? Here we go. Sodomy laws in the U.S. were laws that made certain kinds of sexual activity illegal. In the past, there were federal laws against sodomy. Every state also had a sodomy law, even in the 20th century. Starting in the 1960s, starting in the 1960s, you guys have no idea how close we are. Some states began to repeal, throw out their sodomy laws. And then here highlighted so that a Wikipedia editor can delete it rapidly uh, when Lawrence v. Texas is overturned. In 2003, a case called Lawrence v. Texas. Yeah. Supreme Court of the U.S. ruled sodomy laws unconstitutional. This means no sodomy law in the U.S. can be used to charge a person with a crime. Okay. Most sodomy laws in the United States made both oral sex and anal sex illegal. However, state laws did not agree on who could not do these things. Every state law made sodomy between homosexual couples illegal. Other state laws made it illegal between heterosexual couples if they were not married. The strictest laws made it illegal in every case, even between married couple, uh, couples. Some sodomy laws also included bestiality in their definition of sodomy. Okay. This seems like this seems like something I would do as a joke, you know? You got oh yeah, you guys are like, dude, sucking a horse stick is gross. You have anal sex. Like this sounds like a fucking meme from me, you know? And if sodomy laws were uh, created when America was still a colony of the British Empire, sodomy could be punished by execution in many of the other American colonies as well. In the cases of rape or statutory rape, the victim was also punished often. Sometimes the victim was executed along with the rapist. I love my enlightened founding fathers and our brilliant democratic philosophy. I love the shining light of liberalism cast from atop the hill. Historians are not sure exactly how many people were executed for sodomy in colonial American. In the 1600s, when execution for sodomy was common, there may have been five or ten people executed for sodomy, including bestiality. Five more executions from 1700 to 1776. About 50 people were executed in the American colonies for sexual crimes, though these crimes included rape as well as sodomy. Now here's what you guys are wondering, I bet, if you're clever individuals, which I know you are. Why is it that we're talking about periods of time that stretch across centuries, with only a few people being executed for sodomy? Well, there are a couple of reasons. First of all, back in those days, especially for things like sexual crimes, oftentimes executions were done through lynching. Uh, they were not documented, you know, it was, uh, you know, especially during the colonial days. Um, they, you know, if someone would be accused of raping someone or of being a homosexual or whatever, and then they would get, uh, they'd get yoinked from a tree. Uh, also, record keeping was just not as good back then. Uh, also, um, it's worth noting that the sodomy laws have really always been a um, a deliberately vague tool to use against the socially undesirable. People have been sucking dick for thousands of years, okay? It is not as though, like, someone in pre-colonial America let it slip that they, like, received head from a woman and, like, they both got their heads chopped off the next day. There are people on Twitter that are, like, snidely saying that they're going to outlaw blowjobs, but that's really not what's going to happen. Um, the anti-sodomy legislation has always been used as a way of gesturing at some types of behavior to punish deviancy and homosexuality. And to that end, like, it's not really outlawing oral sex. I mean, maybe you'll get an edge case or two, but 
you know, it's 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 really meant to go after gay people. Um, ba though back in the days of pre-colonial America, there are probably a few more things that they would get you for. Um, anyway, punishments. During the 1950s, McCarthyism resulted in state and nationwide witch hunts of male homosexuals in which the acts of anal and oral sense between consenting adult men were treated the same as child molestation. Well, that's crazy. They would try to ban it from porn, though. Um, I'm not entirely sure how they would manage that. On a state level. Seems difficult. They want to ban all porn? Well, they say that. Anyway, let's go over the sodomy law punishments in 1964. Two to ten years in prison. One to twenty-one, one to fourteen, ten years or a thousand dollar fine, twenty years and a thousand dollar fine, and a thousand dollar fine. So you get ah, I see. Uh a quarter of your life and a thousand just flat out. Nice. About two to fourteen or one hundred at least five years. Twenty years, looking good. One to twenty, ten years or a five thousand dollar fine. Ten years, ten years, ten years. Thirty years from Connecticut. Woo! 20 years in Florida. My goodness. 20 years, 10 years, 20 years. You might notice that this is only half a century ago, and all of these um, sentencing lengths are, like, higher than what you hear rapists getting today. 20 years or a $5,000 fine. Five to 60 years. Wowza. Impressive. 10 years, 10 years. One year to life in prison, naturally. Two to ten years, five thousand dollar fine or both. Ten years, fifteen years, five years or at least a five thousand dollar fine. Two to fifteen years, one to three years, five years or a five hundred dollar fine. Nice. Hell yeah. And then of course, um, you had um a move towards uh repealing a lot of these anti sodomy laws. Let me see. Other seven states changed their laws to say sodomy between heterosexuals is not a crime. These seven states kept laws that made sodomy between homosexual couples a misdemeanor. However, some states refused to change their laws. In 1986, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that sodomy laws were constitutional. 1986. I mean, this was during the AIDS epidemic. I mean, so this was a sort of a component of the administration's effort. to suppress the existence of gay people. I'm sorry, I just don't have much funny to say about this. Lawrence v. Texas. 14 states had not repealed their sodomy laws. It is wild to me that the Supreme Court can rule it unconstitutional for a certain type of law to exist, and the states can just keep those laws. They just can't be acted upon. Like, doesn't it seem... It seems straightforward that those laws would just be instantly stricken from the books, right? as opposed to them just being made null. Since Lawrence v. Texas, five states have repealed their sodomy laws. Montana, Virginia, Utah, Alabama, and Idaho this year. Thank you, Idaho. Much appreciated. Look. They want you dead. They want to kill you. They want you dead. They want you in a death camp. Yes, they do. They absolutely do. What I'm saying right now is not exceptional. All right? The idea that being a homosexual could land you years in prison as a felony was ubiquitous nationwide in the 1960s. Basically, everyone in government was alive back then. In the 1980s, when gay people were dying en masse as a product of AIDS, and Reagan ordered the CDC to not investigate ways of treating AIDS because he thought that gay people dying of AIDS was God's punishment towards them, the Supreme Court reaffirmed le the legality and constitutionality of anti-sodomy laws. The fact that they want you dead 
is not new. It's not some crazy breaking through new extra special modern development. They have just been biding their time. It is that simple. I don't think that should be surprising to any of the people who watch this channel, because if you're at all familiar with leftist history in the United States, what do leftists do but bide their time? It's not as though all of the anti-capitalist sentiment that followed Bernie Sanders in 2016 sprung up out of nowhere. It just catalyzed around a new charismatic figure, Bernie Sanders, as a presidential candidate. And while we want workers' rights and health care for all and liberation for the working class, so too do the fascists want something. You dead. And so too do they bide their time and wait for charismatic figures around which to catalyze their political beliefs. It's as simple as that. It's a very basic political strategy. We all engage in it just for different reasons. I would like to think that our reasons are a little bit better and more humanitarian. Remember the Borat clip where he gets the guy to say he wants to be able to get gay people hanged in the United States? It is really not that uncommon of a position. Religion is the enemy of humanity. I'm sorry. I can't pretend to be... I've, I've only been a level 3 anti-theist on stream. It's time for me to reveal my power level as a level 10 anti-theist. Um, it, is, it is simply... It is mentally crippling. I love and respect you if you suffer from this disability, but I cannot pretend that it is not detrimental. Do you think Jewish people are as bad as evangelical Christians? I think it's simplistic to think of it that way, but by definition, no. You're simplifying it. Evangelical Christians are the worst of the worst, whereas Jewish people are all Jewish people. So that's an incomparable set of categories. As a whole, though, um, the overall social harm done even by Orthodox Jews is a pithy fraction of what fundamentalist Christians have been able to do. Um, I, nothing really comes close. Um, there's, there's really no organization or group that, that even, yeah, I, I don't think so. What about folks who are vague Christians slash others who would have otherwise normal views? Like I said, if you have this mental illness, I will respect you and love you, but we cannot pretend that it is not socially detrimental, you know? Catholic or Protestant right now, which is more harmful? Protestant, by far. It is funny, though, because right now in America, we're seeing a resurgence of Catholic, like fake Catholicism. Not real Catholicism. Like, real Catholics tend to be pretty, I wouldn't say they're chill, but maybe comparable to, like, fundamentalist Protestants they are. The real crazy Catholics are the, um, the converts later in life, because they associate Tradcath, like, like anti-Vatican II Catholicism, with, like, lay epic-based ultra-conservative Nazism, essentially. Um, yeah. Like, that sort of thing. The people who are, like, Catholic by, by lineage, you know, like, they just fucking come up from Mexico or whatever, and they're Catholics, they tend to be pretty chill in my experience. But people, if people who are 32 and then convert to Catholicism are, in my, from what I have seen, tend to be either closet homosexuals or have very, very, very contentious attitudes towards women. And are not dealing with it well. Calling CIA to ask for permission to engage in atheism. True. You've never been to Poland, Vosh? It's insane here. It is true that I am referring primarily to America here. Who's worse, Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses? I don't know. Ask knowing better. Knowing better would know better than me. Atheists will elect officials who are religious, but not the other way around. There are no atheist officials. Like, seriously, like, they're, they're like basically none. There are very, very, very few openly atheist um, political candidates, you know. There are a religious candidates, that is to say, there are people who don't really talk about religion, and you can look at them and go like, either they're atheist or functionally atheist in terms of their voting records. Um, but in terms of like uh, active proponents of atheism, uh, not so common. Not so common. So people were really worried that the Supreme Court was going to do this, and of course they did it, and everything is worse now. EPA ruling, let's go. What does it mean? How the Supreme Court ruling will gut the EPA's ability to fight the crime, uh, climate crisis. Supreme Court dealt a major blow to climate action by handcuffing the EPA's ability to regulate planet warming emissions from the country's power plants, just as scientists warn the world is running out of time to get the climate crisis under control. It's a major loss, not only for the Biden admin's climate goals, but it also calls into question the future of federal-level climate action and puts even more pressure on Congress to act to reduce emissions. 
which will never happen. Why this case was so important for climate action. At the heart of Thursday's opinion was a question over the EPA's authority to regulate planet warming emissions, which was a huge contributor to climate crisis. Around 25% of planet warming greenhouse gas emissions around the globe and in the U.S. come from generating electricity, according to the EPA. And coal, the dirtiest fossil fuel, powers about 20%. Emissions rose, blah, blah. So on and so on and so on. Yes, the planet is warming, blah, blah. We know that. Thank you. The Supreme Court said the Clean Air Act does not give the EPA broad authority to regulate planet warming emissions from power plants. The agency still has options to limit, limit regulations, but the court said the law does not empower the agency to put a limit on emissions and force power plants to move away from fossil fuels and towards renewable energy. So let me explain what this means, okay? So you have two branches of the federal government. You actually have three, but we're going to talk about two right now. You have the executive and the legislative, okay? So when the executive branch does something, it usually does it through one of the departments whose leads are part of Biden's cabinet. Or to put it another way, Biden will uh, appoint and have nominated, you know, and, and approved um, the heads of the many executive departments. Yes? So you have the, um, uh, the attorney general at the head of the Department of Justice. You have, um, you know, the Department of Defense. You have the State Department. You have the, you know, all of the executive branch departments. And when these organizations do something, uh, it's called policy. Now, policy does not have to go through the legislative branch, you know? When the Department of Justice wants to do something, they simply do it. There are limits to what they can do, of course. Um, but within their purview, they have the ability to simply do something. It is an administrative process of the executive branch. That's why the cabinet under a president is so important, because activist cabinet leaders uh, can be very aggressive with the use of their respective agencies, and less so can, well, do that a lot less. Now, the issue here is that, generally speaking, when things have to pass through the legislative branch, they move very slowly and the bills have to be very big and impactful. Think of like all the stuff that gets through Congress. How many bills get through Congress these days? Like one every five years or something? Something like that, I think. That's about how many bills make it through, uh, you know, the House and the Senate, um, more or less. And usually when bills make it through the House and the Senate, they're like these massive bills, you know, right? Like, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars, massive expenditures. You know, you have the budget that goes through, um, you know, to, uh, um, to send off to the executive branch to, you know, fulfill um, the budgetary requirements. You have tax law, you know, that sort of stuff. Generally speaking, the stuff that goes through the legislative branch um, is large and impactful and broad. Now, the reason why the executive agencies have the ability to pass policy without going through the legislative branch, no, I, I'm aware that it's not actually one bill every five years. I'm just trying to make a point here. The point is that the executive agencies uh, act on, regulate, and supervise elements of U.S., uh, you know, domestic affairs that are too granular for the legislative branch to handle. Think of the Department of Agriculture. What do you think the Department of Agriculture has to manage? Well, it actually manages a lot. The Department of Agriculture is responsible for managing not only a significant portion of our economy and all of our agricultural produce, but the unfathomably complicated network of rules that manage uh, the regulation and production of food stuff, soil quality, uh, water quality, like so much goes into it. Like we're talking an unbelievable, uh, you know, an administrative facility of complexity that we couldn't even begin to fathom, managing something very specific, very granular, very, um, uh, I should say expertise driven. You know what I mean? Same with the um, Department of Health, right? Like, or the Department of Energy. Do you want Congress passing bills on what good regulation should be for power plant emissions? Do you, do you want 
Mitch, like Mitch McConnell and the Republican senators getting to weigh in on the exact voltage limits of like daily output of the construction of the, no, 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 no. It's granular stuff. Why am I explaining all this? Well, there are powers that constitutionally were originally given over to Congress back in the founding of this country, back when America was so uncomplicated that the Department of Defense, then named the Department of War, was like a guy with a bunch of rocks. And the D Secretary of State was like just a loud guy they found on the street. Like things were a lot simpler back then. And Congress ha was, was two guys and they uh, played rock, paper, scissors to decide law. That's what it was like back in the founding days, you know? So back in those days when things were simpler, most of these executive branches didn't even exist back then, you know? Um, Congress was the one to determine a lot of the agricultural energy related, you know, that kind of stuff. They didn't even have power plants back then, the fucking morons. Oh, can you imagine? But as things have gotten a little more complicated, Congress has delegated power to the executive, uh, branch, to the regulatory agencies. The reason this is so scary isn't just because it strips the EPA of power. Um, but also because it is part of what will be an ongoing effort to destroy the ability for the executive branch to conduct policy. And policy is important because it is the main thing that regulates the function of the United States. The United States is built upon federal and state law, but it is managed and regulated and controlled by the administrative state. The affairs of our power plants, of our business emissions, our soil quality, our water quality, our air quality, the granular details of our legal system and its limits, these things are products of administrative executive branch decision making. It is the glue that holds the big blocks together. If a, if, a, if a brick in the wall of our democracy is the law, if a brick is our uh, budgetary expenses, the mortar holding it all together are the thousands and thousands and thousands of administrators and bureaucrats who pass policy and regulations meant to keep everything working properly, working faster and more reliably than any big budget bill passed through Congress possibly could. Now, that's not to say the administrative state is all, you know, um, unicorns and roses. It's not. Uh, it's often quite terrible, but it's necessary. That's the critical distinction. The administrative state is no inherently better or worse than any other part of our government. The executive branch isn't, like, magically, morally better, but it is necessary. The country cannot function without a administrative state. It just can't. The country's too complicated. Every country in the world has its equivalent. There is no country on earth with anything even approximating our level of economic and social development for which all decision making is done exclusively by the legislative branch. That is just not possible. You cannot have a legislative body responsible for budgetary expenses, big spending packages, uh, law, legislation, and also like the exact ratio of appropriate chemical balances in soil quality to maintain proper agricultural production. You cannot have the same legislative body doing all these things. It just requires too much expertise. It is part of a long-standing Republican strategy of making the government incapable of doing the things that it needs to do to succeed and then blaming the government for its inability to succeed. You understand? That is what it is. This is monumentally consequential. It is not just about the EPA or the end of the world. The stakes are not that minor, folks. All right? It's not, ju it's not just the end of the world. Okay? It's the end of the world and the deliberate, malicious sabotage of our nation's ability to function on a more fundamental level. 
Moving forward with this article. Opening the door to more challenges. In its opinion, the court cut back agency authority by invoking the Major Questions Doctrine, a ruling that will impact the federal government's authority to regulate in other areas of climate policy, as well as regulation of the internet and worker safety. It says the biggest issues should be decided by Congress itself, not agencies like the EPA. Prior to today, the court would look at an agency and say, this decision is within your lane and expertise, we're going to defer to your technical decision here said Jay Duffy, an attorney and expert on power plant emissions at the Clean Air Task Force. Again, expert on power plant emissions. These are the people who I want making policy on power plant emissions, not Congress. Today, unless the actual rule you've chosen is clearly authorized by Congress, you don't have the authority to do it. Duffy says that as agencies craft new rules, they will have to go back to Congress to get explicit authorization. Imagine having to go back to Congress every time you want to update or add to your policies or regulations. Yeah, good luck with that. The court is saying you can't do big things like Congress speaking, so what is a big thing? The doctrine is just starting to emerge from the court. The doctrine is going to be more defined. I think they'll continue to use the major questions doctrine to oppose EPA rulemaking. It's only going to get worse from here. I have another prediction coming through the ether. The, um, the, the morphogenetic field is, is, is opening once more and divining the future to me. It's time. I'm pulling another thing from the future. I think the reason why the, um, I think the reason why the Supreme Court is gutting the administrative state is because they're going all in on a successful 2022 midterm election and following that, a win for Trump or DeSantis in 2024, which will allow them effective legislative, executive, judicial branch um, synchronicity. And when that happens, they won't need the administrative state because Congress will just be a puppet for the president. Um, and at that point, it's all over. The administrative state will no longer need to function um, because there won't be a practical difference between the legislative and executive branches. That's my, that is my, my guess. Um, because keep in mind, one of the things that got in the way of Donald Trump in, uh, in his, in his uh, uh, term as president, one of the things that got in his way was the administrative state, uh, because it's packed full of bureaucrats who have been around for way longer than him, who know what, way more than him, and who are difficult to oust. Remember how much trouble he had with um, Mueller and the FBI? Not, you know, that's not a, 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 a one of the, the executive branch cabinet positions, but it's definitely still a portion of the administrative state. Um, he can appoint the, ca the, uh, the heads uh, to his cabinet, but he can't replace the entire Department of Energy, Department of Agriculture, um, you know, Department of Justice. Uh, and I think that by essentially neutering them to, like, from the get-go, he can limit the playing field down to only like parts of the government that he can replace directly. Sorry, that's my, that's my morphogenetic prediction. I'm pulling that out of the ether right there. In the 117th Congress, 91% of all bills introduced were not even voted on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, yeah, they don't even vote in a ton of shit. It's a big country. A big, 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 big country. On the 117th Congress, 13,000 pieces of legislation introduced that were not even looked at. That's not necessarily a bad thing, you know. Anyone can write legislation. Whether or not it gets tabled is another thing. Have you seen Moore versus Harper? Yes, I'm aware there's more bad news. Give me a minute, please. Why are Dems not bothering to fight back on any of this if they have so many positions in the government right now? It's like they don't care either. It's, it's not... Okay, listen. You guys have to understand, okay? And you're putting a lot of pressure on the Democrats right now, which you should be, but you have to know where that pressure should be best applied. You have to know what they actually can do. Executive action can't change this. That's not what executive action can do, you know? Um, you can attempt to appoint new Supreme Court justices. Uh, that would cause quite a stir if Biden was to attempt to do that. They would, he would also have to get literally every single Democrat to vote to appoint them. Uh, I think that'd be pretty difficult to do. Obviously, no Republican would. So that would be pretty difficult to manage. The most likely way for Biden to do anything meaningful here would be to go morb mode. Put, like, put simply, 
unfortunately, outside of like loud advocacy right now, and loud advocacy is necessary. Biden is such a lame duck president, you know, like Republicans are doing whatever the fuck they want and Biden barely says or does anything. If you want to see real leadership, by the way, AOC has been demonstrating real leadership. Unironically, AOC, I think, uh, has been um, really taking charge as like the, the voice of the party in the post Roe v. Wade revocation. If every Democratic politician, or even a third of them, had her, like, energy and fire and, I don't know, fucking drive, um, the Democrats would be in a much better position today. In fact, I think Republicans wouldn't even have much of a shot at, like, the presidency. Yeah, uh, no, I think she's been doing a good job to that effect. And I think that, um, if something direct is to be done, it would have to be, like, it would have to be Biden prompting a constitutional crisis before a constitutional crisis can be prompted by the Republicans. Unfortunately, as history has shown us, it is so often the case uh, that when it comes to the, uh, you know, the, the eminent, um, uh, you know, overturning of a democracy, you either... Um, you, you either go joker mode early on and there are a few deaths, or you go joker mode later on and there are a large number of deaths. You can constrain the violence to a small group of evil people, or you can let it spread out to a very large group of generally innocent people until things fizzle out and end differently. Um, I think, I, like, if the Jan 6 committee hearings do not lead to the arrest of key Republican figures who are associated with Jan 6, like, the Dems will just be leaving it on the table. They'll just be leaving it right on the table. Everyone says, you can't do that, you can't do that. And then the Republicans just do that. Democrats love fascism. I've said this before. I think that it, it betrays a poor imagination on your part if you think that the behavior of the Democrats has to do with duplicitousness. Duplicity? I think it's duplicity. Um, I, it's, it's not Democrats being secret buddy buddies with fascists. It's really not. Liberals are just like that. You don't understand it because you're young and a radical, which is good. You should be uh, a radical. But the, the liberal political mind state is, 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 is one which believes that there are fundamental, universal uh, elements of civil... <sighs> they think... They think that the right people will always win out in the end, that taking the high road always leads you down the right path, that abstainiousness carries its own rewards, that patience and deliberate, virtuous abstainiousness always pay off because people who are uncivil, people who break the rules, at the end of the day, they lose. They are Pete Buttigieg. Think about Pete Buttigieg. People for whom politics is not about historical materialism or about power, but rather about, you know, mason jars, unshrouded light bulbs hanging from ceilings, and pithy Obama-esque speeches about hopes, virtues, lights, justice being touched from the hill of the America's life's whatever. Yeah, go watch the West Wing if you really want. If you really want to see how liberals think, go watch the West Wing. Or you know what? I want, you know what, you know what else you can, because a lot of you haven't watched The West Wing. Have you ever watched Parks and Recreation? P imagine Leslie Nope taken out of her universe and put into ours. Imagine how dejected and impotent and weak she would be, constantly being tread upon by people who don't give a shit about her or humans in general. That's what, like, the liberal is. The best liberal is a well-intentioned, pure-minded weakling in a world of lions. That's what they are. It, that's the best of them. The best of them, virtuous people who do not know the game that they are playing, who don't understand the world that they're in. Um, of course, this is a varying thing. There are liberals who are fully aware of the threat of fascism. You know, this is obviously sort of a gradient. I'm talking about the pure liberal right now. The you know, the archetypical liberal, the platonic liberal. Um, it doesn't make them an ally to fascism. Uh, not always, at least. It doesn't make them a bad person either. It just means that they aren't really aware of the nature of power. They aren't really aware of the stakes at hand. They have too much faith in the institutions, too much trust 
in the historical inevitability of the prevalence of the civil and the decent and the noble hearted. Some of them um, will be allies to fascism, but unfortunately, I think <sighs> liberal is just too broad of a term, you know? Liberal refers to so many things. It's the philosophy of the Enlightenment. You know, the Enlightenment spawned so much of modern economic, political, and philosophical discourse that, like, liberal can refer to so many things. Are there liberals who are primarily interested in the maintenance of their businesses and will vote primarily on tax legislation and little else? Yes, there are. I don't know if you could fairly call one a liberal who would collaborate with a Nazi regime back in the 30s or whatever, um, if it meant saving your business. I think there are liberals, and then there are people for whom liberal society is convenient. Does that make any sense? Uh, this is very common with fascist coups. They appeal towards a sort of um, embittered or greedy or desperate um, upper class. Uh, you know, the, the usually the bourgeois side with the fascist revolutionaries or the fascist coup because they were promised, you know, uh, compliant labor conditions, to put it lightly. But I don't think those big business people who side with the fascists, I don't really think they're liberals. Like, I don't think these people are all gung-ho, tolerance, progressive, and then the fascists come along and then they're like, oh yeah, we're totally okay with death camps, just keep our taxes low. I don't think, I don't think they're liberals, really. I think they're mostly apolitical outside their own power and self-betterment. And when, when chips are on the line, like, they'll do anything to maintain that. But that's not an ideological bias towards liberalism. That's just surfing the Kali Yuga of liberalism until the next wave comes along. The only reason I'm saying this is because I think sometimes, like, the discourse gets a little bit muddied when people are like, you know, well, liberals side with fascists. Well, not really. The fascists kill liberals, you know. It's more like oftentimes the liberals are too weak, inept, or naive to do anything about the fascists. And there are people who weren't openly fascist, who felt it easier to work with liberals beforehand, who will then find it easier to work with fascists when the opportunity presents itself. Liberals are often useful idiots, or inept but well-meaning allies. And they can be made, what's the opposite of inept? Ept? <laughs> um, disinepted? <laughs> they can be made competent allies uh, under the right conditions, I think, you know? I think it's also, oh, adept! Of course, adept. Inept, adept. Now, what an odd, um, a lot of old liberals are hard to move, though. That they are. But keep in mind, keep in mind, folks, look at the French resistance, you know? Look at the revolutionary cells within uh, Nazi Germany, you know, France, Poland, Northern Africa, uh, Italy. Look at what was going on there. Are many of these groups leftists? Yes, they are. Many of them were socialists, but not all of them. In fact, probably a minority of them. The majority of people who were fighting on the ground in revolutionary cells against the fascist occupation were probably liberals. They were just anti-Nazi. People misunderstand. Being anti-fascist doesn't necessarily mean being a socialist, you know? You could be a liberal and be ideologically opposed to fascism. In fact, being a liberal means you are ideologically opposed to fascism. I think being a socialist makes you a better anti-fascist because you're better able to critique the underlying material conditions that lead to fascism, and you're generally more aware of the nature of power and the accumulation of material power. But you can be a liberal and an anti-fascist. I don't think those are mutually exclusive at all. I say this to remind all of you that Democrats, while they do suck, are um, a particularly inept wing of the supermajority of this country, which is liberal. The majority of this country is liberal. Uh, this country is full of liberals, and these liberals are ideologically opposed to fascism. You know, how effective they'll be in any real dispute, uh, to an extent, comes down to us. We are shepherds. It, ever since the great battle between fascism and socialism began, you know, the great, the real war, 
It has been the prerogative of socialists and anarchists and anti-capitalists of all kinds to guide public attention against fascism, uh, to lead that effort, to convince people, uh, to educate people. Are we appreciated for it? No. Do we often succeed? No. We get our asses kicked from time to time. Um, but it is still our job. Um, you know, uh, socialists, anarchists, union leaders and organizers uh, have been prominent in anti-fascist action in America for as long as that has been a thing, prominent in resistance cells across occupied Europe, prominent in denazification of Germany. It's just something that we seem to keep finding ourselves doing. So take pleasure in that uh, role. Make it your job to talk with liberals and convince them. Why do you think I've been adopting the rhetoric that I have over the past couple of weeks and months so aggressively? My primary concern is not entertaining or appeasing or educating the socialists in my audience because you are socialists. We already agree. I know where you stand. My interest is convincing liberals how bad things are capable of getting so that they will be more aggressive advocates for their rights and for our rights. Um, you know, uh, should that ever be necessary, which it's most certainly fucking is. That's what I care about first and foremost. So just keep that in mind. When, when, whenever, whenever you are feeling horrible about the future of this country, please just remember that you are in America here. You're sharing a space with literally hundreds of millions of human beings who are ideologically opposed to the tenets of fascism. A lot of it is just guiding people to the appropriate response to the existence of those things, you know? Think about it like um, climate change. Climate change, right? The vast majority of people outside of the fundamentalist Christians, of which there are maybe, I don't actually remember, 20 to 50 million in this country, hundreds of millions of people in this country, are ideologically opposed to the consequences of climate change. Sea levels rising, drought, famine, tornadoes, hurricanes, tsunamis, floods. You know, you line all these things up. Are you in favor of droughts, hurricanes, tsunamis, floods, blah -de blah They say, no, probably not. They are opposed to what will happen. The goal is to convince them that it is necessary to be active in that opposition. And the United States, outside of recent backsliding caused by an undemocratic, Republican-controlled Supreme Court, uh, has generally moved left uh, in its opinion on climate change. You have to be the advocate. You have to be an evangelical for anti-fascism. You understand? You have to be a preacher. They don't care about arguments. You need to instill fear, unfortunately. The arguments should make people feel fearful because what is happening is scary. But that's still an argument. You seriously underestimate how hard they will hold on to the idea that it can't happen here even as it happens here? Don't tell me I underestimate it. You think I don't know? You have to try anyway. Sorry, throwing your arms up in the air and going, oops, I tried, is not... Uh, not a reaction to great crisis that people will respect uh, in the future, you know? Uh, I'm afraid you're just going to have to keep trying. You can complain about it all you like, but you have to keep trying. You don't get to not try. Again, think of the odds that our uh, ancestors worked against, you know? All those union organizers and socialists on the streets of New York back in 1908, fighting for an end to child labor or for weekends or whatever. All those men died of black lung with broken spines in their 40s. You know, they lived miserable lives. But we now get weekends. It's, it's about keeping the chain going. Pass the bucket. What's the rendezvous plan if we lose 2024 Iceland? I'll just create Chaz too, and I'll just stay in there. I'll create a second Chaz right around uh, a, a Starbucks in Seattle, and I'll just work on my laptop. You know, I never visited Chaz 1 back when it was made. Thank God. You need more Haas energy, just show up to Chaz, try to lead them, and have it be a stain on your record forever. Dude, the kinds of people 
who were at Chaz last time are probably the kinds of people who would shoot me on sight. <sighs> I'm more like, if I ever get shot in public, it is far more likely to be from one of them than from a fucking fascist, okay? I, yeah, I would need to show up with my, with my motley crew. The Valshite army. You know, funnily enough, Seattle's a big city. If I said, hey crew, meet up here, I could probably get like a hundred of you, maybe two hundred. We could all march together on Chaz, just occupy a corner. Yeah, this is the this is the fucking Voshite corner. Keep walking, you know? We could just take like one corner of the Chaz block. We could all be like whittling, you know, like menacingly. Like maybe a reporter from WAPO comes in and they're walking through and they just see like two hundred gay people, like with one foot up on a stump whittling like a branch propped on their knee or something. Like in, in time. So shh, you just hear all of them at the same. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, yeah. Look, looking like fucking greasers or something with leather jackets and white, um, white t-shirts that with a, with a U-boat neck. And slicked back hair. Absolutely. Yeah. Pompadours. Bosch side story. <laughs> The, the, the reporter walks up to start asking me questions because I'm at the front, you know, and everyone in time sets down the whittling equipment and you all start snapping and like stepping forward like this to the to the beat. As I start delivering my answer rhythm. Just sounds like a psychopath. Oh, God.